Okay, I believe we are. Can someone confirm they see my screen? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we're ready. Good to go. Mm -hmm. It's 3 of 7. It's time to convene the Grand County Economic Development Advisory Board meeting for March 29, 2023. Welcome everyone opening items. Welcome and introductions around the room and around the screen. So let's start with folks who are online. Maybe Sister Kelly. I'm Kelly Thornton with the Department of Workforce Services. I don't know about anyone else online, but I'm getting a serious echo. I'm wondering if maybe somebody else who's signed in needs to mute. I don't know. It's good to be here. Thanks for the point. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shaylee Bryant. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person today, but I will be present for the, the meeting on Zoom. Welcome, Shaylee is our secretary for the board, um, and obviously a traveling mom today. Denise? Hi, Hussein Denise, private sector. Um, I do get also some sound issue. Looks like to me it's freezing in the meeting room, but if I can't catch it up, I will definitely drive down there and I'll be joining in person. Thank you. Wonderful. Let's get to the Jays. Jasmine? Hi, Jasmine Duncan, uh, Mayor Town of Castle Valley. And Jenny? Hi, Jenny Gleason, Travel Council Advisory Board. We're at Tillier. Thanks for joining us today, Jenny. Thanks for the invitation. Excited. Is, uh, is Sarah there? Sarah's here. Hi, I'm Sarah Kyle. I'm with Powerhouse Events. It's good to see you all. Thanks for being here. My Thanks pleasure. For... Chris, you're on. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. This is Chris Baird, uh, Grand Canyon Budget Officer, Strategic Development Director. Wonderful. Do we miss anybody who's online? Carly. Carly and Carly. What is it, Lisa? I just saw the C. Carly. Probably. Manager of Walking Water City. I think someone else can. <laughs> We know who she is, right? Yes. Okay, let's start around the table. Miss Lisa, I think. Yeah. Um, Elisa is I'm here. I don't have my video on. Sorry. Um planning and zoning director, non-voting member. Where is she? She's under the logo, behind oh, the logo. Okay. That's why I didn't know that she was here. Melissa. Melissa Jeffers, citizen in the county. Welcome, Lisa. new board member. Yes, first meet you. Very excited. Yes, good. Welcome, Mary McGann, Commissioner. I'm Forrest Rogers. Mary McFall, um, USU Workforce Development. Karen Guzmanuni. Chris Wilson, member of the board. Rob Walker, Love Community Child Care. Ben Alter, Economic Development Specialist. And I'm August Grant. And we should mention that Rob Walker is an emeritus member uh, of this board, or maybe he's just an alum of this board. But not 
with standing. He's here and he's got something to share with us in a little while. Um, this is my first uh, meeting as, as your chair. And so forgive me if I misstep, misspeak, um, and please call to my attention if I've overlooked something, okay? Um, to begin, we've had introductions, the uh, opportunity not to um, state any conflicts of interest, disclosures, or ex parte communication. What would ex parte communication be suitable for? It's a great question. I'm not. I'm not totally sure. I'm not. I'm not the bylaw knower on that one. Okay. I assume that. Pardon, Mary. What is it in the commission content? Oh uh, well, if there's like you, you're in a zoning. You know, working on a zoning or somebody's asking for a zone change and you communicate with them outside of the chambers, you know, say you have a conversation with the city market or they call you, you have a lot of for a zone change. Okay. You have to say, you have to talk about so that all people in the body have knowledge of what it is because that's why it's a is everybody's that everybody that's in the board should have the same information right so so i'm trying to you know where this is an advisory board i'm just anyway if anybody thinks of the answer let me know um, so it sounds like we're getting some bad audio in the room is it so bad that you can't really it's not fun Can people hear Honestly, anything it at all? It depends, it depends on who's speaking. So, Ben, you're very clear. <laughs> it's in and out. Um, if we, anyone... we could try just reconnecting. Just We might as well just try deconnecting it now while we're connecting it. Okay. I think it's, yeah. I, I think it's just the yeah, Wi-Fi. Um, I don't know. Try if, to... Trying a hotspot would help. Like if somebody had, if you guys have full cell cell bars on your phones, I don't know if that would be better, but it's an idea. Just go you you just go audio only. Right? That's a good point. I was excited, but you. Maybe there's a setting there. Let's just start. Okay, well, this is an easy thing. We're gonna try it. Can someone just say something again? I think it, it sounds okay right now. With we, can, I can hear everything you guys are saying, and it's not cutting out. So, okay. Um, can, can Karen? Can you say something? Uh, can you hear me? I'm at the end of the table. Yep, we can hear. Yeah, Karen. that sounds clear. Yep. Okay. Good. Great. Okay. Nice We've avoided the unplug and plug in again <laughs> strategy for fixing that. Thank you very much. Um, notice that what we're trying to do, we've, we're going to spend on each topic. The goal of that is to create some longer time later on the agenda to have some conversations about where we go post HP 416. So that's a goal there. So um, first thing, the, um, we're a month away from the Grand Summit, and it's uh, an opportunity for us to all hear about that for those of us who weren't able to be there. So I will turn that over to Ben. Before we get there, for us, I think we should acknowledge that today's citizens to be heard. Okay. Um, and then I have just a brief presentation to kick us off. Oh, you do, okay. I did not know that, so let's go to that. Citizens to be heard. Um, Brad, did you have anything you want to add as a citizen? No, I just listened in. Okay. Okay, wonderful. That seems to cover it then. There's no one in the waiting room. Okay. Okay. Oh, great. How do I do the carrot and the share? And then, um, oh, great. 
with the big rag. Okay, cool. Uh, this is not a, a, a really long one. I just wanted to tee up some context for the discussions um, at the front end of the meeting on Royal County grants so that you know board members have context in terms of what those mean, what those numbers mean in context. Um, and also provide kind of a brief piece of context and an opportunity for folks to ask questions. Um, uh, Chris, potentially, on kind of diversification TRT monies and where that all stands. Um, so to start with, um, we have a lot of the conversation on the front end of this meeting is with regards to the funding received <clears throat> last year for the Rural County Grant fiscal year 23 to take fiscal year July to June. Um, so we need to spend that money basically out of our coffers by the end of June of this year. Um, and I want to provide some context. Okay. Um, so this column here is what was in the original application from this board to the state <clears throat> at the end of August, excuse me, at the beginning of September, um, were these categories which we, we said this is what we'd like to fund, basically. Um, so with that in mind, I put in the amount of money that has either been already allocated or we're proposing to discuss today. Um, so those are itemized down here, under proposed spend expenditures. So we've already allocated and recommended 18,000 for the, the deed restriction compliance software that's already um, on the books and out of our um, conference has been spent. Under consideration today is gonna be the balance of this child care support line, the $75,000 that um, agenda item, some additional funding, and we'll have to figure out where that's going to land. Um, and, and then the piece on the agenda today is the uh, AmeriCorps VISTA initial match. Um, so that's a for a huge new VISTA. Uh, the county just approved that MOU the last meeting. Um, so we just want to kind of be aware of the statutory requirement of this board to kind of recommend um, in here, create the kind of net balance of, of kind of unallocated and unplanned to be allocated money here. Um, so 57,000 for workforce housing support, um, netted out to zero for child care support, uh, 16,000-ish dollars that came from the summit that can go to other places. Um, and then uh, the balance of, of what we applied for in the AmeriCorps VISTA was, was intended to go towards um, rent and um, food offset for that um, staff person. I think one thing that Chris brought up to me is that potentially the payments under um, the the grant, I assume just crap uh, um, under the let me share my screen. Sorry. Should have baked in time for technical difficulties today. Yeah. And the cleaning system, the budget gets this. You'll have to get the speed wipe. Yeah. Fiber. Fiber. Are they planning to get fiber? They might already have a fiber. All right. <clears throat> um, there's been some discussion that maybe these these payments for the Vista and for the summit could just come out of the balance of our diversification spend and 
leave more money out of the rural county grant pot for other direct community support projects. Um, Excuse me, can you say that again? So in conversations with, with Chris, um, the next piece I'm going to speak to is that um, the possibility of instead of spending, you know, this balance of our cost for the summit um, out of this um, account, pay it out of the remaining diversification funds. Um, and, and the same could be for the AmeriCorps VISTA payment, which would then free up an additional $50,000 within the context of the rural county grant for more direct support programs. But that's kind of a question that's in, that's in flux. Um, so um, we don't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this as a resource as we discuss the, the line items throughout the rest of the agenda. Um, if there's any questions, I just wanted to make sure that the board members had some context here. Um, the last thing that's under here is there we had before, you know, we got very heavily um, busy with recruiting and, and interviewing and getting new board members. And with this legislative session, kind of we're in the middle of discussing a handful of options for that workforce housing support line. And so these are these four um, options kind of came out of that. So those are just place held there. For now, although it's not in the agenda item um, for today for discussion. So I'm going to go to the next piece here, um, which is that we're working internally to calculate the total amount of um, revenue available from TRT um, that can be spent on diversification. Um, just basically, how much did we start with? How much have we spent so far? And how much are we forecasting to receive before the end of June? Um, and within that context, planning on a budget amendment to ensure that those funds are going to be spent by the end of June. We've gotten feedback from the state auditor that given that that piece of code is going to be entirely um, repealed from state law, that we would we, if we want to spend money on that use. We should do it with that piece of state law as we pay So before July 1st, we have to spend the yeah. money we assume we're getting. It. Yep. So, <clears throat> so kind of just want to keep that in mind. That's not really on the agenda today, but um, in a way it is as we're starting to have these planning conversations. Um, so that's just kind of a general, you know, setting a stage update from uh, from the big in the bird's eye view. And then uh, as we go to the agenda, we're going to touch on the uh, smaller bits. Um, I might, if people have questions on us, I might just hold until we get through um, kind of our agenda and, and then kind of circle back to that later. So that's just, I just wanted to set the stage for the rest of the discussion today. Okay, great. Um, okay, Forrest, did you want me to then uh, begin now with the Grand Summit overview? Yes, after I confirm with with, uh, with August that we have essentially discussed AMD on the agenda, the review of the summit expenses. Um, was, was that sufficient to address that, your verbal about the... You don't have to, don't don't worry about going back to it. Let's go ahead. And okay. Let's let's just start with the grand summit. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I have to see if there are any presentations. That was it in public comment yeah, as yeah. well. Okay. Yep, I think we're all good. Okay. And then we um, we were distributed minutes of prior meetings. Correct. No, there, there's no there minutes on this agenda. Okay, so I wasn't the only one who missed this. No, no. That's a good I, I removed that from the. Uh, unfortunately, our we were buried this week, so that's understood. That's un understood. Okay, so overview of the grand summit. Yeah, happy to. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, if someone could again let me know if they can see my screen. Someone out there. I can. Okay, great. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, the internet is real fast. Okay. So, um, 
I'm just I'm here to just do a, a brief recap uh, of the Grand Summit and uh, Sarah Kyle, who is here with us from Powerhouse Events. Uh, Sarah uh, is someone that August and I connected with at previous events that are put on um, at the state level, things like the Outdoor Recreation Summit um, and like events are what Powerhouse works on. And so this year we really want to kind of increase the, the value added with the summit. And so Powerhouse worked with us and um, we're really happy with the results. So uh, basically I just wanted to just show you all, and this will all be handed out after the uh, meeting. So don't worry if you miss anything. This is just rehashing essentially uh, what was on the schedule for that day. Um, we had some great morning discussions kind of setting the stage for what the economic development atmosphere and foundation for Grand County looks like. And then throughout the day, we kind of expanded that vision to think more regionally, think about energy trends nationally, um, and other events that we had going on. We also had ample networking, we had some stretching, and we had some really cool prizes that were donated to the summit, which hopefully kept people in their seats till 4.05. Um, we had some really exciting sponsors this year. Um, thanks in no small part to Sarah and her team. Uh, we really were able to up our sponsor game and this year um, sponsorships were more flexible. A lot of folks donated um, different services or prizes, whether it was something we gave away at the end of the day or uh, the flowers that were decorating the stage and at the pre-event reception. Um, so we had a lot of community partners with this and it was just, uh, it was, Last year was, was a great start for us, but this year I think we doubled or tripled our just number of sponsors. Um, so it was great to work with more partners. Let's see. And then this is just uh, showing um, some of the speakers that we had. Well, all the speakers that we had, um, Rob and Megan were just some, just a few of the speakers that we had. Elisa unfortunately was sick, but she was there with us in spirit. Um, I love Corey's photo of him wrangling <laughs> cattle. Um, and, uh, and again, just, you know, um, the level of, uh, professionalism with all the materials that we got this year out of powerhouse was great. You know, this is what the program of the day looked like and, um, just very professional, very, very swanky. So really thankful that we had their partnership on, it. um, just some quick highlights. So, uh, just like last year, we had just under 160 attendees, which is what the hoodoo says is their, you know, their safe number, um, in the future, we might be able to fit a few more folks in there with just playing with the room, but still 150 to 160 feels like a really good audience when you're in there. Our ticket revenue this year was uh, more than double what it was in 2022. Um, that's a no small part because we did raise prices this year, but also um, we had a pre-event reception and we had some speakers that we wouldn't have been able to get last year. So we really think that that raise in price corresponded with, again, the value added that we tried to bring to this year's summit. Um, and with that said, you know, we brought in a lot more sponsorship dollars as well, which you'll see on the next slide, but sponsorship dollars before the rural county grant funds that August was just discussing uh, reached just over $20,000. I'm just going to check the chat here. Oh, Brad said he enjoyed the summit. Thank you very much. I'll add that testimonial later. Um, we do have a really cool event website. I'm not going to click out of it because it's a mess, but it exists. Grand Summit Moab. I think, oh, maybe it's the, anyways, you can see it later. It's great. Grandsonboat.com. Thank you. Um, as I said, we had a pre-event reception. The Red Earth venue um, was where we had it. Moab Brewery, among other vendors, were there. And uh, it was just a great way to just start soft networking, getting to know the folks. And if you're coming in from out of town or if you're a local, you know, you could bring your family or something or bring a plus one. And so it was great to just see everyone before we got into like the business of it all. Uh, we had 27 speakers. Our postcards this year were something new that we did. So last year we had some we had some great tables. And we really wanted to make sure that we uh, got our folks this year who are attending to go to those tables to learn about the sponsors and the resources on hand. So we had these awesome postcards that I'll show you in a second, where if you got X amount of stamps, uh, then you were entered for a prize in our drawing later in the day and the tables stationed around the resource area will give you the stamps. So we got a lot of good feedback. That was a great way to engage the tables, get people to, you know, during their networking breaks, not just talk with their friends around tables, but like really go out and check out the resources and the sponsors that were on hand. Um, and then we had some really cool giveaways. Um, so let's see. Oh, we got some testimonials here. 
Uh, I'll pass that around later so you can uh, read this. Most of this is pulled from our feedback survey. And of course, we do have some constructive feedback as well. Um, but this is the super positive stuff that I like to read before bed. Um, so this right here is that passport that we were talking about. So you basically, you, you put your name there and your email there. That way, you know, if you left the summit, then, you know, we can mail you your prize, but everyone stayed. So there was no need to email them. Um, and then this is just an example of some ad copy that you may have seen in papers around town or online, trying to get folks engaged, scan the QR code to learn more. And some of our top sponsors were featured on the bottom of those ads. So these are how prices, uh, or rather um, our financials broke down year over year. So this year we had um, a big increase in sponsorship dollars as well as ticket sales that I talked about. Um, you know, the ticket sales, again, we had about the same number of ticket sales, but the price was much higher. The sponsorship dollars, you know, serious kudos to Sarah and her team for really going out and getting sponsors, not just within our region, but bringing some folks just from within the Four Corners region to help strengthen some really cool conversations. Um, so huge value added, big jump in our sponsorship this year, um, which gave us, uh, you know, a big jump in revenue as well. When we look at expenses, uh, we spent, you know, just under what we spent last year to put on the event. Um, Sarah's team does come with a price, and uh, I think it's totally worth it. And so with that added in, the net cost of the Grand Summit comes out to just over $8,000 here. Um, looking last year, that's still an improvement from our net cost from last year. And so um, that's, uh, those are the main takeaways. Uh, another another thing I want to plug is that um didn't really have a lot of photos. If you were there, you were there, but it was super exclusive. So if you weren't there, you missed out. Um, we, some people took some photos from with their phones, but um this year, since we had so much going on with the legislation, there were just small things that were overlooked in event prep, and photography was one of them. And so next year, we're excited to get a photographer to memorialize the event. But as you can see here, um, the room was beautiful. Here's a picture of one of our presentations on responsible recreation. And this is the view uh, outside of the Red Earth venue right before the reception the night before. Check the chat real quick. Let's see. Um, uh, impact on staff, uh, it may have been less than 2000, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I would say that <clears throat> last year, Ben's full-time job was the, was the event for about two months. Um, so I mean, three months. You, you can calculate that, but that's, Pretty yeah. under and some, yeah. Um, and you know, Ben was able to be an actual staff person for our office for the for those three three months of time. So, from a from a pure anecdotal how it felt in the office perspective, um, the fact that the net cost was actually less on net, I say net twice. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a, it's a no brainer for me. Yeah. So again, I'm I'm happy to I'm going to pass these slides around afterwards, and if folks have uh, more detailed questions, they're welcome to ask afterwards, or while we have Sarah here, um, if you have any event questions, either of us are happy to field them and just talk about the summit. Do, ma'am? Yeah, please. Um, so out of the 153 attendees mm -hmm. and the 27 guest speakers, was that number, so is it really 125 or did you count those speakers as the it's a good question it's a it, it's a, a math problem that i haven't done but I'd, I'd love to do after this some guest speakers only stay or only there for their session then they left and sarah and i mostly sarah um and sarah you could probably speak to this better than i but i know that sarah and i were trying to figure out with guest speakers you're going to stay the whole day you're just going to stay for your session so Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but we accounted for that for the most part. So if a speaker was going to be there the whole day, they're part of that number. And if they're just there for a bit, they weren't. Yeah, so we we account for the speakers in our registration numbers. Um, traditionally, you know, especially in a low in a location like Moab, they tend to stay the entire day. And that registration is our number for name badges, meals, accounting for all of the expenses that come along with the event. So yeah, they are counted in that 153, but I would say the majority of them stayed. I know even people coming from Salt Lake City stayed um, and were there the evening before. So they earned it. Which is great. I know of one speaker who came in just for a session, rolled up after lunch, he was done, he left. Um, 
But yeah, it sounds like for the most part, people did stay. So I guess those 27 speakers is for the majority part so, of that I mean, 150. And did you, did they didn't have to pay, did they, to be, I mean, did we have 125 okay. tickets or 122 tickets that's yeah sir do, do you have the number of if we removed the tickets that were comped for speaker sponsors what was sold so the sold number is our ticket revenue so we'd have to break that down i don't have it in front of me we'd have to break that down by numbers but yes speakers are comped so that we take into you know account their schedules and travel time and their expertise and adding to the event so we usually comp all speaker tickets mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can do some quick math after this and figure out what that like really no looks like. I, I mean, I yeah. figured speakers would be comped. Yes. Sure, but I'm <laughs> yes. Just curious what, the, what we ended up on mm -hmm. the ticket. Yeah, and some sponsors was. also got, if and you sponsor a certain level, you could get a few seats. Um, right. And what was the ticket, the ticket price? Yeah, we had a, a, a we had tiered ticket prices. Sarah, do you remember the tiers that we did? Do we start at 65 or 70? Let me just get in there for you. I think maybe a better use of our time would be just maybe adding a little bit of a ticket breakdown and just email that out to y'all. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, happy we to. can do that. No problem. Yeah, so good question. I'm happy to send that information out for this. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Are you ready to take on the next item, the next bullet, which is a grand summit planning and coordination committee? Yeah. Do you want me to speak to that or do you want to speak to that? I can speak to that. Sure. Um, in brief, uh, I think that last year <clears throat> we kind of very unilaterally did this summit and we got an interest from at least the chamber to be involved and, you know, and they were involved in at a, at a higher level of, in that we consulted them and made sure that we had their input, um, but I think the intention here is that we want to make, you know, a, a, a subcommittee of this board um, to have like one person kind of be just a little bit more in touch. And I use that as a place for the chamber and other other stakeholders to be involved in the future planning of this. Um, and then that'll, by the creation of that, hold us accountable to making sure that we have a timeline and that it's, it's relaxed enough that it's not a last minute push. Um, so, yeah, I think that um, the thought there was if um, we want to um, create that as a subcommittee of this board um, and if anybody wanted to express interest. Um, and so I don't know if I'm, I'm not the chair anymore, so I'm, I'm not going to say anything about motions, but. <laughs> Given what's the time that you would have for um, having that group? <clears throat> well, I think we want to start in earnest sometime this summer. This summer. Okay. So we can pick this up at a, at a meeting in May, perhaps. And by then, you may have a clear idea of how you think it might be organized. Sure. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, let's move on to the next item, which is a recommendation to the county commission to make an award to the Moab Community Child Care Center. And everybody's received the um, proposal that Rob has submitted, I hope. And so I would turn that over to you, Rob, to talk about the proposal. You've given us some great detail about accomplishments and number of people you've seen, number of communities, number of organizations you've already helped. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to try to keep words because, um, yeah, I mean, this board really um, set the whole trajectory of this organization when they gave us $100,000 last July and really challenged us or made me feel challenged to, okay, this is a problem. How can we spend this money effectively and work on it? Which was not immediately obvious. Initially, we just had the infant care center and you know there's only so much that you want to invest in that. And then we have to think about a new center and so forth. So yeah, we developed helping hands with it. And anyways, really appreciative of the board's support of us. 
and hope we continue to earn it, um, future support. So um, yeah, frankly, um, you know, we've been growing so fast that um, having some funding right now would be really helpful for us to not have to slow down our growth. I mean, we're obviously um, trying to stage our growth so we don't staff, we're growing pretty quick. We have 11 employees now, um, that's gonna go up. Um, but, uh, and I have in the back last page, you can see kind of how helping hands demand has increased uh, since we started. And uh, it's gonna increase dramatically more from there very near term, depending on as we hire more staff. We just are, we're in discussions with Grand Preschool right now. They're having trouble staffing. And they're having to go down from four to two days. They're still a part-time program. We don't have a full-time preschool in town. Um, so yeah, we're hoping to have 32 hours a week um, and then we'll negotiate a price with them that's kind of comparable to what they were offering the job for. And then we will ultimately pay our workers a few dollars more an hour because they are not able to attract workers on their own. Um, and then we have a one provider uh, who can potentially increase from eight to 16 spots. But to do that, you have to hire a person and take the risk on while you um, grow into those spots. So you know that might be a ten thousand dollar investment on our end, um, but we think it's really good use of money to increase the number of spots permanently in town, um, because a provider wouldn't really be apt to do that on their own. Otherwise, um, it'd be a big financial risk. They would have to have savings to to handle. Um, so yeah, um, if you look at our like the hours in the back last page, you'll see this is February. I didn't put it in March, but it's tracking well above that and um, close to around 400 hours. And I think that we can get probably towards 800 hours. Um, when I mean, perhaps as early as I mean, a few months away, perhaps. Um, so that's pretty cool. So, but as a result, we obviously could use some more certainty over funding. We are looking for other funding sources to have more sustainable, uh, more diversified um, funding uh, streams. In the future, we hired a grant director, Matt, a grant uh, a writer, Maddie Fisk, who a lot of you probably know, who was the executive director of Sea Haven for a number of years. And uh, she works for a company in Salt Lake that does remote um, kind of work for different organizations for grant writing. She works with some people in Moab. The cool thing is that actually we were able to get her because she had more time available because she just had a baby that is now in our child care center. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, and then in addition, we started identified some some TANF opportunities, which is I don't know if you're familiar with TANF is it's a ten billion ten million dollar pot of money in the in the state of Utah, which it's federal you know, appropriated uh, money, and that'll be for three year contracts. So we're going to be applying for some through that, which we think that's pretty well suited for because the goal is to their goal of that money is is kind of similar. It's you know you, you know uh, increasing protective factors, reducing risk factors for children's development. Um, so um, yeah, I, I don't know how much I should talk with this to this proposal. I can talk for a few more minutes if, and if people haven't maybe read it, I can kind of hit some items or we can just go straight into like Q and A right now. I really enjoyed reading the presentation. It was impressive. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've uh, yeah, I've been doing a lot of research on the issue and I feel pretty um, like I, like I understand it and there's, there's only a few elements and maybe I'll just like kind of at the risk of being an extra minute or two. Um, I think one of the most important ones for everyone here is mostly as some of an economic background and, uh, you know, I have an economic background as well. I was on this board. Um, and so I find it really interesting and it's, it's a unique situation where the market almost works on its own. So it's not a situation like we're not a nonprofit, like, um, you know, say C Haven, where there's no program revenues from people don't pay for the service, for instance, you know, no one assumes that they would. It's 100% grant funded business. Um, it's more, um, whereas in our case, uh, you know, we people pay us, um, you know, for our, for our services, providers pay us co pays for our support. Um, but it doesn't quite work on its own, which is um, interesting. And we could try to make it work on its own, um, but we would sort of undermine our mission because we would end up having to charge more for our service, which would price out a lot of people. And that's kind of what happens nationally. Um, the largest providers of care, uh, the two, they're publicly traded companies, Bright Horizon and Kid Care, 
their average for an infant is about $2,200 a month. That's like nationally. So a city is going to be like three or $4,000 a month. So if you can do some math on that quickly. These are, this is a service for, you know, people that are very well off and making, you know, over six, well over six figures. Um, so, um, but then what you have is you have this like difficult, difficult situation where you have extra demand for the service. Um, a normal market would adapt to, to provide a lower quality, lower priced alternative. But in the case of watching kids, you know, kind of like I make the point, like it's like sushi that no one wants, like the gas station sushi on discount because it makes you nervous that you're going to get hurt. And um, so the state regulates all that. So there's this like chronic shortage. And I think the solution that you know, we're kind of stumbling on. In some ways it's elegant, in other ways it's clunky. It's, we're kind of intervening on both sides. We're saying like, you know, um, we need to pay more than the market is gonna pay for these jobs. And we need to charge a little less than, than our costs. Mm -hmm. And so the way I see our organization is, is trying to be as efficient as we can with the, um, the, the funding that we get. So we only need something like 10 or 20% of our overall budget to be filled with grant dollars um, you know, and then the rest is going to be people are paying us um, for the service we're providing. Sorry. I, no, it's okay. I think Jasmine has a question for you on what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I do. The, the only question I had, I was looking at everything that you sent and that was in our packet. Um, out of the 100,000 that was already uh, granted, there was a section that said how much of it was spent. So is that not all, yet all spent? Correct. Yeah. Yes. We have spent, I think it's there right below there, uh, 53,000. If you scroll down a little bit, that's how much we've spent so far of the hundred thousand dollars. That doesn't include March. I'm sure March totals is going to be at least another $5,000. Um, of that, our payroll, um, is like running. I mean, we have other sources of funding, but our payroll is $25,000 a month. We have 11 employees. So, um, and like I said, I want to, we have demand for our services to increase that. And it's pretty scalable. We hire a person, we get them trained. They then work in that center. And, you know, we have an app that tracks everybody is. We have a person who, you know, who's managing it. So we can dramatically increase those hours um, without um, kind of like, uh, without any extra administrative burden, really. Um, but yeah, having some line of sight to more money would be great um, for us. And so that's the that additional 75,000 will get you through to, to like when? Yeah. So um, it's, I'd say it's certainly over 12 months, um, but we are applying for other grants as well. You know, the TANF, we think we might get $60,000 from that, but um, that's for over three years, which we would use to then sort of support um, our administrative costs of the grant, which would be like, you know, 15 thousand, maybe 10 to 15,000 for, you know, the person who's in charge of like making all this work, um, our director of outreach, Taylor Rutherford's um, position. Um, so um, the, the other part of the grant is for a new program for employer supported child care. And, um, you know, depending on what the, the board wants and things like that, the last grant, we kind of left it somewhat uh, open ended in terms of how the money will be allocated between different program ideas, because you know, we're not sure how quickly some of the things will go. Helping Hands has gone a lot faster than we thought and more demand than we would have thought. We didn't think this was, an, was the idea. When we started, it was just a few hours a week for providers. And then we kind of stumbled on that, you know, it made sense for us to sort of employ childcare workers and to sort of, um, you know, to ensure that they would stay in the industry and help grow the industry. Uh, if the employer supported childcare part grows faster, and we get other funding, we could move some of the money around. Um, but we could talk with the board and report um, on that. Uh, so it's just to give us right now, uh, I think if we did not get this money right now, it would force us to be a little nervous to expand and to be able to handle the extra demand. And um, uh, we might have to then look at the co-pays that we charge providers where we pay $15, we charge them $15 an hour right now. For the services we provide and we our total all in cost might be $25 an hour. So, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer uh, your question? This gives us a lot of runway for sure. But my, my plan with this um, nonprofit, and I mean, uh, it's, I, it's, it's been like really surprising and, and positively surprising to me how it's all going in that 
the, the th sort of theme here is like, let's use our money as fast and as efficiently as we can on our mission and we'll get more of it if we show what we're doing. So, I mean, we could right now just do nothing, not raise money and just run an infant care center. We're fully booked. We've got 18 kids on our wait list for 12 spots. So, but we're thinking, okay, what more can we do? Um, Rob, we've got questions from Chris and Karen. So let's start with Karen. Okay, I'm gonna give shorter answers this time. Okay, <laughs> I just was curious about your um, employee retention. It shows that you haven't yeah. lost anybody, which is super exciting. Yeah. Do you guarantee a certain amount of hours for your employees? I, how does that, is yeah. it, are they on like contract? I mean, how is that, how is this working? Sure, yeah, um, it's, so we have, one of our great hires early on was Taylor Rutherford. She is our director of outreach. I have put her in charge of our, our personnel. She decides when we need to hire someone. Um, she runs all that um, process and um, she's really good with people. And her main job is to, we have, you know, on one side, we have eight providers, including our infant care center, you know, that have needs for staffing. And then we have 11 employees who have needs for, you know, wanting to get, to get paid and have work. And so she balances both of those situations, and um, yeah, there's no rule to it. Um, there are a lot of some, there are a lot of consistency where people have a schedule, but as you can imagine, our, all of our employees are mothers. All of them, like you know, there are some right now that are that are you know, that are, that are you know on maternity leave. Um, so the needs change, um, and we've had a lot of growth in our demand, so we've had to hire new people. Um, so. When I first started, it was when we didn't have, I felt like we didn't have a lot of work initially when we first started, and we had to hire people and that chicken and the egg of making sure you didn't have people that were unsatisfied with their hours. But that has not been a problem for us. Uh, most of our workers on average, you know, their spouse, spouse works, um, and they work about 20 hours a week on average, I'd say. Um, and some are go up or go, go down from there. And that's one of the benefits that we can provide versus if we were just one center. So we can hire some as a caregiver and we can say, if you want more hours, like we have, you know, all these locations that can potentially have more demand. Um, and then the new center at the old USU campus, mm -hmm. that has not been created yet, correct? Correct. That, and so will that, will you, if the business end of the the share program works is are the you are they going to be doing child care at that center i i was i guess i was under i didn't quite understand yeah where so i can talk a little okay. bit about so so this is our the rural county part b or the rural, the rural communities grant the the that, that this board wrote a recommendation letter for a while ago you know was granted we got three hundred thousand dollars of the city of moab got that money um, to support a child care center. And the proposal was for a center at the former USU campus with Moab Free Health Clinic um, donating some land. Uh, we are still in discussions on specifically how that will be like enacted. Uh, we are looking at uh, renovating and look right now we just today submitted a grant for $600,000 to renovate that South building they have at the campus for a large child care center. Um, and then three hundred thousand dollars would go together with that. Would be if we can get that, we're going to hear back in a few weeks. And if not, we'll move forward with a manufactured house, um, either at that site or we might actually. If we can, I think it makes more sense for us to put that manufactured building next to our Lutheran Church Center because we have a quarter acre of dirt there, and um, we can co-locate a center, which then means a parent who has kids of multiple ages can have infants and kind of preschool in one area. So yeah, I'm kind of I'm definitely busy with stuff, and it's a big thing that we're working on right now. And we hope that we're going to have a nice press release out of our decision of what, what's going on probably a month from now. Awesome. Karen, yeah, that's it. Chris, a very quick question and then a comment, um, and it might be a question for August or someone else here. But we this money needs to be spent by the end of June. The, that means allocated to an organization. Yeah, and that's a paper to keep books. spending into the future. Correct. Yeah, there's no, mm -hmm. the only the only part of these kind of state funded rural county grant programs that have a stipulation relevant to the actual final end use spend is the competitive award. <clears throat> so what we, what we were awarded for Oreo Crossing projects, um, because that hadn't been spent yet was why we were why the city basically had to apply for this program for the child care center yeah we 
were basically, they were like, well, you have to spend your money. Yeah, so you can't apply. So we are anticipating that that piece from two years ago will be spent from end users that we can reapply for the competitive piece this fall. Um, right. But the, the, the traditional, like guaranteed 200,000 part A, they, uh, the state just cares that we've spent it, we've allocated it, yeah. and they consider, okay, we, you know, that is that is meeting your priorities, it's meeting your obligation. Um, they don't they don't require us to do like an end use report. Perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would just say that, Rob, what you've done with this, I mean, I think it's nothing short of incredible. I think it's it's just remarkable in the short time period that you've been at this problem, how much progress has been made. <laughs> it's exactly the kind of thing that I think we should be supporting. I mean, I think that our job is to get new and effective initiatives off the ground that wouldn't otherwise be happening. And so if we can support you in having more impact faster than you're already doing, I, I think it's exactly what we should be doing. In the long term, I mean, I hope that our funding can help you find other sources of funding that leads to long-term sustainability, right? And I mean, so I think that that, process of having somebody else on staff to help do grant funding, apply for other grants and things like that is is a really useful piece of this puzzle. Um, so yeah, I just very much support what you're what you're looking to do here. Yeah, just to be clear, I mean I think everybody probably knows, but I I've been sort of the unofficial executive director of this um, nonprofit and and I'm, I'm an unpaid volunteer. So um, and I, we have had a lot of success, but there are certainly days where I feel uh, either inadequate or like, you know, I mean, I, I, I think, I don't know what my hours are. I work a lot randomly, random times. I, I'm very focused on this. I'm not on any other boards right now. I don't want to be in any other boards because I come up with good ideas when I just focus on this. Um, but yeah, um, the last few weeks with this, uh, new center going on, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, our funding is, you know, not hundred percent right now. And then in terms of this grant, and then our payroll and things like that. It's like, okay, we're just going to keep keep building. We've got two great directors. Um, and then, yeah, but hiring um, the part-time grant writer. And then one of our employees turns out to um, be a part-time bookkeeper as well for other companies in town. So we're having her do that. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping maybe she can evolve into like a VP of finance type position. So we can kind of like divide this up so I can kind of, um, yeah, just find the right balance for me. So I'm, I'm not, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of little little paperwork and stuff. We have a great staff. We have eleven people, so it's definitely not like all me. But yeah, um, looks like Kelly has a question or a comment. Yeah, I, I just think it bears um, mentioning that not not only have they done amazing work, but and and opened up a lot of slots for childcare, which is much needed in the community. They're also supporting several small independent businesses, probably most of which are owned by women and those are those are both things that have been missions of this board for since the beginning so i think i think that's that bears being said i think they've probably helped keep several of those businesses in existence which is critical for our community so i just wanted to make sure that was noted thank you that's great yeah, great point I mean, yeah, we, we definitely like a lot of those workers. We a lot of our eleven staff. I mean, we're not working before we hired them. They were they were stay at home moms. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a great example of entrepreneurship in the social sector. Mm -hmm. It's a great example. And to your point, the um, degree to which you're capturing the data and the return on investment is is one thing that will appeal to funders. What appeals in this community, I think, is the return on relationships that are created among and between the child care providers and their clients or beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's another benefit that this program is bring, bringing. So Mary, did you want to say something? Are we going to add something? I was just saying it, it's created like a team rather than, you know, it's a team of people, maybe different businesses and organizations that they become, it, to me, it appears as though they've become a team, that they all have the same mission and the goal, and they support each other in meeting that goal. It's, I remember six years ago, we started talking about getting day daycare here, and it just, and all of a sudden after you became involved and the diversification money was yeah. able to be given, I think that was the big thing, you know, you, being there at the right time and the money 
made it possible that people, something people had been working on for six years came to fruition much better than we expected. So and money well spent. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, I think this is such a, a smart direction that that Moab needs to take note of, of that, you know, rather than having it be every man out for themselves, every child care center out for themselves, like having some umbrellas where we're supporting the, you know, same types of businesses. I'm I'm excited to see where he can go from here because you know, I think he's got the right idea. He's got to have uh, more sustainability of funding. And uh, I think this is where Moab needs to go as a as a whole. So I'm pretty excited to see what, what happens next year. Well, let's um, entertain a motion to send some money to the Moab community child care. Is there a motion to allocate or direct recommend to the commission this funding. I would move to make a motion to allocate $75,000. Can I ask one more question before we go there? Um, so I know a lot of people that have, yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Hold on just one second. Yeah, let's, let's first can, have a can you guys, Let's okay, first have go a ahead. The motion and then we can dive in. I, I second the motion. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then you can dive in. If we all agree that we're ready to go. I just had a quick question about it. Um, I was wondering, like, with the, the wait list that we know that's going on with kids, like, is it first come, first serve? Is it differentiated by age groups? I was just wondering how that, that kind of came into play. Yeah, so... Uh... We our wait list that I mentioned, we have 18 kids. Some of those kids, though, are have not been born yet. They, they're gone on our wait list for our, our infant care center. Um, yeah, I mean, we have we only have we have 12. That's a real thing. I mean, it's a really big issue. Yeah, yeah. we have we have 12 full time spots. And so um, some of those are we offer part time. So I think I don't know, we have maybe 16 or 17 families. A lot of them use us half the time. Um, we don't currently, one thing I want to do is to be more of a clearinghouse for all the, the child care providers and like a wait list. We sort of do that informally right now when someone calls us. We only serve kids up to the age of three. And if someone is over two, we, put, we, 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 uh, we push them to the other providers and we just focus on infants and now we're full. So everybody that reaches out to us, we, we work with the other providers so we know where there's open spots in town. Um, so we're doing that. Um, we can do a better job of like having that you know, on our website of what all the people's phone numbers are and things like that. But we're, we're handling the, the incoming people that we get. And it seems like lately it's, it's definitely increased more because I think as people know that the service is there and the product is there. I mean, we heard from the past that some people just won't even look for childcare because they just heard anecdotally it's not available. So they just, you know, um, so the biggest need is certainly among infants because, you know, they're, um, it's really costly to provide for them because the ratios are so hard. Uh, but, you know, we don't have a full-time preschool in town and, you know, we have so many, you know, however you, you slice it, there's, there could be, you know, probably 200 more or more, you know, spots of childcare. So um, whatever we can get is going to be, is going to be filled pretty quick. Um, yeah, I, I, does that answer your question there? Yep. I mean, yeah, I was yeah. just, I was just curious the process. And, and the other thing I'll just add, like, I mean, well, I don't know. I, I can't help myself. I mean, I, I, one thing I probably did not make a point of in this report as much, but just so you know where we're going with this, and this is how the two proposals tie together because we have this employer supported, is uh, availability and affordability. And both of those in, are, so one, you obviously need availability to begin with. But if we had tomorrow 100 spots for child care in this town, or full-time child care spots, that would we probably fill them eventually, um, but you know, for a lot of people, will struggle to pay that. That will not qualify for the federal subsidies. So that's why we need to do the other affordability programs to find. You know, a lot of people have money to pay for it, but they don't have a thousand dollars a month per child to pay for it. And again, that's like below what our cost is with no rent. So um, yeah, we're working on both of those things. And as we have more affordability options. That will create demand for childcare. We're going to go to employers and say, 
you know, do you have people that are working part time that can work full time? So, I've uh, failed to keep us within our targeted time. Yeah, sorry, uh, that's probably my fault too. Uh, you were asked questions and you answered them. So I would. We have a motion on the table to recommend to the county commission funding of this grant, and I would ask those in favor to say or indicate aye. 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 Three, four, five. Aye. Six. I oh sorry I'm not voting <laughs> sorry. Okay. I've, I've lost okay. track of, of every voting everyone who voted but we certainly have a majority. So I think we should take the. Oh, win. there's Mary is here. Yeah, Mary, Mary? Not, not Mary. Oh, okay. Yeah, and she's locked up. It, it, we'll it might be useful to ask for dissenting votes just to ensure. Yes, of course. Is there anyone who dares dissent from this request? <laughs> Hearing none, we will make the recommendation. And Rob, thank you so awesome. much. Awesome. Thank yeah. you guys. Yeah, I will look forward to continue to report to you and you know, reach out to me if you have any questions you want to talk about it. Um, or if you have any good ideas. I mean, we're still we're coming up with trying to do new things to try to work on the issue. These programs are part of that. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good work. Thanks. Next agenda item is revision of the rural county grant. Uh, proposed expenditures for 2023. Is that you, August? Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, sorry for the trip happy there. So we kind of already went over this. Um, the the basically this is, this is now real. I'll update this by saying this is spent or or recommended, I should say. Um, now that that's happened, but I think. The, the only other thing I would maybe have us discuss here, and maybe this is the opportunity to ask questions about where this all lands and thoughts for the future, is um, I don't I don't think we necessarily need a motion on it, but um, you know we, the the county has approved the MOU for the Vista that was applied for. It's in there. Um, I I don't think we need like a formal vote to say yes, let's pay this amount, but just wanted to flag that to make sure that. Um, that's uh, kind of fully aware of the board that we're going to move forward with that, unless there's there is discussion or concern. Um, and then I think separately, just being aware of kind of what is available and, and going forward, maybe thinking about um, future agenda items at the end of this meeting um, about what components of this we want to flesh out, what do we want to see. But I, I think it's a good opportunity to maybe just have a quick discussion on on these numbers, make sure everybody feels up to speed. And, and um, go from there. There was more, wasn't it? Like, okay. yeah. So the only ones that aren't under here are the, the handful of workforce housing support programs that are under consideration, kind of for the future, um, but aren't on the agenda today. So, yeah. Any any questions on kind of where Royal County Grant for this year money we have that we need to spend by June um, sits? Or any thoughts? So if we, sorry, no, go ahead. If the 75 goes to child care, as we just recommended, um, the 45 goes to Vista out of this or TRT, I don't know which way you wanted to do that. Where, how much is that? What's left? I so what I can, I can just do scenario here. Yeah. What, what, are you, what are you proposing for which categories here? Uh, I'm just so asking what's left, basically. Okay. If I feel that needs to be spent between now and June, supposing that the 75 gets approved by the commission. Okay, uh, supposing 75 gets approved, and maybe maybe let's do two scenarios. Supposing that all of the VISTA and all of the grants that gets paid out of TRT, then I'll I'd zero these out, which would, would leave 107,000 total to be allocated on um, right now. Now that would be out of the 75 for workforce housing, 57 on um, total unallocated, and then an additional 50 that could go towards um, more housing, more child care, or, or an additional priority um, that we will forward after, I think, the next conversation is kind of about planning. But if there's something that comes up that would be an urgent funding need, um, you know, I think that probably the best way to go if we have unallocated funds or unprioritized or strategic category funds would be um, once we have a good vision of how much we have to spend from the diversification side 
what the needs are and you know how much money we have total figuring out on balance you know what maybe there's something that's really important that is not seeing funding um, at that point um yeah so that's kind of my first first response there and then the, the alternative a different scenario where we fully pay this out um would be something like <laughs> we pay that for, for the grand summit and we fully pay this full amount um to the vista timing is going to be funky there so i'm not sure how that's going to exactly work but it would it would it would be more like seventy five thousand yeah, in terms of fund allocated. Thanks. Yeah. So what you're asking for are suggestions about the reallocation. I think I. Response. How would you state that request? Yeah, I think I'm actually more. I wanted to just get make sure there was visibility and clarity as to how much is unspoken for at this time, mm -hmm. and then I think during the uh, future agenda items section of the meeting. Um, if board members want to throw out, okay, let's let's dive into the agenda of the housing piece of the next meeting, for example. Or, um, but I think that's a really good starting point. We already have a couple of projects that have been scoped um, that kind of have been on pause. So that's something I would think that we consider at a next or relatively near future meeting. Um, and I think that there's a certain amount of um, opacity around these two numbers as it pertains to the larger picture of how much diversification TRT money is there going to be able to be spent. Um, so <clears throat> I think starting with, with the housing projects and at least identifying, okay, getting, getting dollar amounts attached to these projects and um, doing an initial, how much do we want to fund for any one or a number of them? Um, and then hopefully on our end, we'll work to get a bigger picture of the entire um, kind of a resource, resources that we have available. Um, that we're working with Chris and, and then also there will be a process with the commission and, and the Child council board. Mm -hmm. But um, so I, I would say I'm not, I'm not looking for, I don't really have a request. I think this is more right, getting us all on the same page and then um, my, I guess, recommendation and, and I would express this to you as board chair, would be that you know we consider the workforce housing support programs as soon as possible, as soon as convenient, basically. And then if other of other board members want to kind of put discussion or action items relevant to the remaining funds, that we consider that as well. Great. Great. Any questions? Comments, concerns? Can't tell if Shaley has a new question. Shaley, is your hand up from a previous question or is that um previous previous question previous right. question sorry all right. cool well i'm good to move forward if there's no other questions on that first one okay so are we now on the free clinic the vista for the free clinic let's see i think that um my my thought there was i don't think we need an affirmative vote or a motion to to recommend that spend because the commission has already approved it mm -hmm. um but mainly wanted to make sure that that was a part of this meeting so that the, the board is aware that they're probably going to move forward with that and create space if there's kind of dissenting thoughts on that, right? We shouldn't or should consider others then. Okay. So if there is, I'm not hearing that. So we're okay. happy to move forward unless there is. Okay. Uh, let's move forward then. The next item is on the agenda item E is discuss the post HB 416 planning process. Okay. And uh, August and I have talked a little bit about this. We started talking, having a conversation even before our last meeting, given the, the implication or the expectation that diversification would fall out of the um, out of the funding for our work. Um, and everything that the commission has said, both about economic development and diversification, can really be boiled down to a couple of things. And so I think that this part of the conversation, which I hope will take us, give us 30 to 40 minutes for, is really to start having a conversation about how we move forward, um, what we think we mean when we talk about economic development, and, and then start talking about how we can use what we've learned around this table and online um, and how we collaborate with the travel council to start thinking about 
a an economic development strategic plan that incorporates the tourism ecosystem along with everything else we're trying to accomplish in terms of our goals or of improving the community's economic resilience, um, really working to support local businesses, even those, and especially those who are not tourist dependent, and really try to find a way to build a community conversation so that people have a sense that they get, they're getting heard. And we have a lot of talent on this board, and it's an opportunity for us to get involved individually and start working on specific elements of that community conversation. So that's that's the context for where we got to here. Sweet. And uh, go ahead. Okay. So um, you know we've talked a lot about you know how changes to the budget and, and state law and everything has happened here. Um, and and <clears throat> I think last time I I kind of pointed out my view of you know, my optimistic silver lining view on the changes that. Um, in, in a way, it's a, it's a clearing of the, the table and opportunity for um, a reset and a depressurization of this conversation topic um, and to kind of reestablish in you know, well-facilitated community spaces that are outside of you know, the commission chambers or the city council to talk about kind of really in the weeds on um, what, what, we, what are we trying to do here and, and set the stage for moving forward. Um, and I think it's really important to note that the the goal here is to be jointly doing this process with the Travel Council Advisory Board, um, you know, having them really focus on some of the tourism silo focused question areas, um, having this board focusing on some of the more holistic and some of the economic diversification specific question areas, and, and then figuring out who exactly is going to program manage, you know, take notes and facilitate and all the rest. But that, you know, the hope, the hope is to move us forward. So I'll I kind of try to frame this in the kind of Simon Sinek, why, how, what, circle, 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 circle method to get us started. Um, so I think my framing of this starts with the fact that um, I think everybody can agree that our community is relatively divided um, and, and, you know, the only communication, only, you know, if you talk to someone who this isn't kind of their daily life to deal with these policies or to work in either of these fields, um, the one conversation around economic development that happens is more tourism or less tourism and the various kind of emotionally charged, um, you know, arguments that come along with that. And I think that those emotionally charged arguments often shut people down and people don't want to participate. And so they say, see ya, I'm going to go ride my bike and get to my happy place. So, um, you know, the, the follow-up here is that it's preventing us from really digging as a community into the nuanced weeds of defining a more holistic vision for the future that comprises, um, excuse me, comp that has some compromise in it and it also kind of aligns on common sense solution that we can really rally behind. And the thinking there is that if we can find alignment on even a handful of priorities that collectively we can push forward on those projects, pursue resources and make politically durable programs that you know, we don't have uh, rug pulling crap from under us, like what just happened. Um, and so, sorry, my slides are clearly not how I want them to be set up. Um, so that's kind of the big why. And I, and I should say with the grain of salt, this is generally my view and my framing and by, by osmosis of the last two years of just kind of trying to do this stuff. Um, and so this is all up for discussion in terms of like getting different input and perspectives, but this is just my setting of the stage. So I think I have four kind of guiding questions around the how, um, which is, you know, how do we create a holistic vision, set of priorities and develop programs that drive economic opportunities to support all of our local businesses, workforce and residents, you know, kind of really touching on the fact that, you know, whether you are, a, you know, a guide of <clears throat> a climbing guide or you work at the hospital as a nurse, all, all of the, there's a certain amount of, of, of the rising tide lifting all boats at some level, right? Um, and that certain programs are not going to be differentiated between tourism, not tourism. There are going to be certain things, like I think childcare is a really good example. Uh, that's going to support mothers and families, regardless of what industry they work in, and allow for increased revenue for that family. Um, a more targeted question is how do we manage to sustain a thriving tourism ecosystem that drives economic benefit to our local community 
while managing the real environmental and quantity, community quality of life impacts that come with that. And trying to have that conversation and in a, in a facilitated, empathetic, um, and compassionate environment. Um, how do we diversify our economy so that it provides more year-round full-time benefited job opportunities that are uh, untethered from the visitation curve? So I've been trying to come up with language to describe that, and every different day is different. But basically, you know, it's not it's not correlated to okay, it's spring and people are here, so I have a job because of that. Um, it's a more smooth and consistent um, personal revenue stream for the household. Um, Yeah, these slides are bad. Okay, um, and then lastly, how can we work together? And I think this is actually the most important one. How can we work together as a community of individuals with different perspectives to achieve that goal in a collaborative and mutually respectful fashion? Um, and you know, I think that those, those touch on notions of transparency and, and equity and making sure that there is a good faith effort to include all of the voices in this conversation, um, because I don't think that you achieve a politically durable outcome in the absence of that. And I think also people don't show up if they're anticipating to be subjected to emotional trauma in a, in a community planning space, which I think happens all too much there. Um, and then I tried to boil those down into actual, uh, as, as Forrest kind of put it, horizontals. So overarching kind of goals, actual the actual what, um, under which there's verticals that are specifically focused on creating actual programs that create outcomes in this kind of these what category. So, you know, one, we want to, you know, thinking about driving investment in economic infrastructure that supports all local businesses, workforce, and residents. Um, continue to manage our tourism economies so that it drives economic benefit to our community. Um, work towards smart mitigation of the environmental and community quality of life costs associated with the growth of our tourism industry economy. And then lastly, increase the amount of year round full time benefit jobs, kind of similar language. But those being kind of my starting point for you know, the horizontal the big goals um, and objectives. Um, and then the intention here is to bring stakeholders from here on out, bring stakeholders together, identify gaps and propose solutions um, and try to do that in a way that, you know, this board is uh, pretty involved in. So kind of want to start on kind of this high level uh, you know, there, I have a bit of an exercise that maybe we'll start with, actually. But um, what we're going to go to is kind of go over, I have kind of put together a handful of like vertical areas that that capture some of the work we've already been doing. And I think help to think through what my prop, my, what I would propose these community dialogues start in different categories as. Um, and wanting to discuss that together, make sure not missing anything, ultimately getting to a point where we have an idea of who would want to be involved in which conversations. Um, there is a need to figure out who's going to program manage this, whether that's a uh, consultant who we bring on for this project or um, some kind of staff. Obviously, staff gets difficult because all of a sudden our ongoing funding is gone. So um, to have consistent staffing that is not focused exclusively kind of in the tourism realm becomes a tricky question for us. Um, and then the goal would be, you know, at the intervening travel council board, we're doing a similar exercise, focused kind of on the tourism sectors and coming up with those vertical question roundtables. So, you know, say we end up with eight or nine or something like that, having people assigned to that and, and kind of figuring out, okay, now we have generally where we want to start, how we can actually make that happen and create a timeline and bring it back to the next. Meeting, but I think where we wanted to start for an opportunity for a bit of reflection um, is kind of with all of this in mind, and also bringing like everybody's I think unique perspectives to this board. Take take five minutes um, and you know write down and reflect. You know what does economic development mean to each of us? Um, and you know, of course, is recommended a partner exercise with a lot of people online, so we can't really do that. So. If people want to partner up in here, or if they want to do their own reflection, that's up to them. There is, but we, uh, we don't have a team left. We're not going to go for that. So, so I think the easiest thing is, I, I think, given the time frame that we have, 
let's just take five minutes individually. Yeah. And we talked with Ben and he's agreed to scribe and take take down the comments that people online and in the room have um, as in the answers to these questions. Um, so that yeah. be a little bit more more efficient for the time. So do you want to start with the reflection still first? No. Or just launch right into it. But let's go with it. Let's go with it. I thought you were asking me to start reflecting. No, no, no. no. You do want to hold five minutes for reflection though. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we'll start a timer here. Um, but let's just take five minutes for everybody to take some notes on their own uh, documents and, and reflect on these questions here. So we're going to five minutes reflect, and then we're going to share what we've got. Yeah, share back. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe consider both these. So the difference between economic development to us and economic diversification. Not necessarily the difference, but what do each of those, when you hear those words, what do those mean? Um, you know, personally? I'm I'm looking at the clock and I'm being respectful for everybody's time. Let's make this a 10 minute exercise with oh. a, just 10 minutes for both of those because people may want to do them together. Yeah. And then let's take the time to get people's feedback yeah. and response. And I'd especially like to give time to Jenny to to share her reaction to this possible process because the travel council obviously is an important um, voice in, in all of this. So 10 minutes to think great thoughts. Okay. And then we'll we'll react and Ben has agreed to start tallying up the responses. Is that clear enough? All right, so we'll come back at what time? 437. Yep. Okay. Ben, are you keeping the timer? Yeah. Only two minutes in. Mm -hmm. We got that. So is it is it effective for us to just all sit here and take notes on our own or is the discussion more effective? 
I think we're starting with uh, just reflection on our own, and then we're going to do a share back at 437. Thanks, Shirley. We're six minutes in. Oh, sorry, we're four minutes. I'm in. sorry, six we're six minutes left. I, I'm misreading hand signals here. Um, we're we're four minutes in. Um, maybe the thing to do for those of you who are online is to just um, raise a flag or a hand when you are finished, so that we have an idea um, of when we should start moving forward. Shaylee? Okay, Shaylee, Jasmine, looks like, yeah, Kelly, I've got base thoughts as well. Done. Yeah, I start you working. I've done this for this county. Oh, How yeah. many Four times. Four times. We do it quarterly. <laughs> we at the SBD. SBD. For the spark, for spark, for workforce development and yeah. for business okay. development. So okay. I had a few ideas before coming. Okay, so you had a start. Karen, a little bit. Karen, how are you doing? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, doing okay. Okay. Chris, good to go. Whenever. Good to go. Thank you. Melissa, good to hear you. Yeah. 
Okay, do we have everybody? Is everybody complete? Let's see. Um, I've got a, yeah, I've got a hand raised from Shelly. I think that means she was done. Um, and I've got Kelly's thoughts. I've got Elisa's thoughts. I've got Denny's thoughts. Um, Jasmine, I don't know if you're going to speak or just type something. Let's see. Um, Chris can weigh in if he wants, but I, it seems like everyone online is either, I've got their notes or they're going to say something. Great. Well, let's move forward. You got Maybe it. let's start with the notes that you received, Ben. Absolutely. And then we'll go to folks online and then folks around the table. Sure. Um, so should I read just verbatim what I've got from folks? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, the first comment here I have is from Dennis, and he says that uh, economic development <clears throat> means well-being and quality of life for a community. Economic diversification is encouraging the positive economic growth um, within various, uh, within a variety of economic activities. Kelly said that from her perspective, economic development and economic diversification must include a component that supports the ability of local residents to find sustainable, appropriate employment that allows them to not only live outside of poverty, but attain a quality of life for themselves and their families that others in the community are afforded. Typically, this equates to wages, but that is not the only factor. Job satisfaction, work-life balance, and potential for advancement in a career are also elements. Kelly also says that she's really intrigued by Shaley's comments about umbrellas of cooperation for individual business slash employment sectors. So we'll be asking Shaley about that. Um, and then she closed by saying, I think this could be a very good starting point to achieve what I'm mentioning. And Mob Community Child Care has created an interesting mod. Um, Elisa, a uh, PNZ director with the county, said that economic development ideally means the process by which a community can either sustain a healthy balance of existing markets or can work towards achieving a healthy balance of various markets that meet the needs of the community and provide opportunities for local residents to not just make a living, but to thrive development overall. And it is a measure of a healthy economy. And then I, I got one that I wasn't able to add. Jasmine wrote, <clears throat> Economic development, creating opportunity for everyone. Uh, economic development, creating opportunity for everyone in the community to thrive in a way that is sustainable and manages our resources into the future, focusing on quality of life, diversification, building a resilient community. I also have some comments here from non board members that I, I could read. If, Let's go. I, I don't know the protocol there. Okay, so I've, I've got um, from Brad, he said, at the most basic level, economic development means not exporting your kids and creating an economy that has, quote, meaningful jobs for its residents so you can retain your best and brightest. He added economic diversification is taking the peaks and valleys out of the local economy, um, moving upstream to maximize the resources you have. One important item for progress is to keep infrastructure ahead of growth. And then Jenny said, development means to be conscious about the local history and a sustainable future with as many local resources as possible. And that is everything that I have in chat right now. Oh, and Jenny added diversification means to be inclusive with local stakeholders and visitors to our area to help ensure a healthy economy. Um, so that's all I've got from online world. I think that Shaley probably wanted to speak. I'm trying to think. I think that's the only person we haven't heard from online. Sure is. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't have my laptop with me, so it felt like typing was going to be a lot. <laughs> um, well, you know, honestly, this is a super passionate topic for me of, of what these mean to me. And honestly, when I when I become when I visualize it, it becomes a circle with ongoing arrows of economic development to economic diversification. Um, what it means to me is they, they do actually envelope each other into their definitions. One does not exist in a healthy manner without the other. Um, and I believe it is a, is a formulation of ecosystems that need to have a thriving <laughs> balance, I guess is the right word. Um, I think everyone, what everyone's saying is super on point of that we can't put too much focus on one or the other, because if we, if we put too much focus on either, both will fail, unfortunately. So having a good balance and umbrella 
um, the sentence that I have come to use often as of late is stop fighting to be right and fight to solve. Um, and if everyone could come to the table and be willing to compromise on, on uh, their, their, their belief systems, because to be honest, everyone arguing with, with what this means is right because it's their own feelings, it's their own value system, it's their own beliefs, they're all right. So uh, that, that's where I, I come in is that we have to fight to solve and what that looks like for Moab is different than it is for big city governments and big city economies and us working together, like kind of what they're creating with the childcare to me is along the right lines of how do we come together and solve a problem? So that's all I got. Thank you, Shaylee. Um, around the table, who wants to start? I think Dennis, right? I, and yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Dennis. Yeah, I think um, I have some couple of actually ideas, questions, or maybe opinions as well. Looks like to me, every individual in this meeting, even online or on the board right now on the table, we have some special people like Kelly Thornton. She's working for work workforce, right? So it looks like to me she has many data uh, insights about how many um, workforce we have here in town. How many of them seasonally come in, enjoying their time and then going out again out of Moab. So to me, I have not really exact numbers, but looks like me first we have to approach to this situation to bring up what is mean to us and then how we can develop part is counting, analyzing, and I have really no idea is any of us or any department of the county has that data. Like, looks like to me we have 10,000 people living roughly in this county, but we don't know how many of them really hardly working, how many of them retired, I don't know, and how many of them really partially they're working. And what are the metrics? Do we need more people in this town? But before that, of course, we know very major problem, housing, major problem child care major problem any other uh, part of the part of the chain so what i want to say is like i do believe to bring up our well-being and making quality of life for every individual here is in different categories i do know many people they're really in well-being they have no concern but they're suffering with the workforce so it looks like to me there is no balance between of the social, economical um, um, difference in the community. So I think we need to really get to approach in the in the right um, questions. Um, that's what that's what I like in these meetings. Actually, while uh, August was presenting the questions, why's and then the what's, that really brought me up suddenly. I just would like to negotiate a little bit about this. To me, it looks like there is no enough workforce or enough number of employee in this town to run the businesses. So to me, we need to increase the population. That's my point, either wrong or correct. So I don't know, does that make sense? But it looks like to me, before we are dreaming all, <laughs> I don't wanna be like dreamer in these questions. I want to be the real with the numbers, actually. Do we have any data or who can really support us with this? Or any of us has any idea I would like to really listen? And I think we'll get to that in just a second. So really good question, Dennis. Um, and uh, I can address that in just a second. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Melissa, do you mind going ahead? Sure. Um, so obviously this is just from my perspective. But for economic development, I define it as a systemic or a holistic approach to removing the barriers and creating and cultivating the opportunities to increase three things that I like to focus on. And that's regional prosperity, which I don't think is necessarily equated with growth. To me, there is definitely a difference. And parity. And I think about that as parity of the region, meaning I think the quality of life for a rural town should equate to the quality of life in a city. That may mean different things for income, but I think that there should be parity between those two things and also parity within a community. Like you don't want too much concentrated at the top and then, you know, a whole sector that's there to serve the rest. 
and also economic participation. And I don't necessarily track that to me in terms of like, what is an employment figure? That can be entrepreneurship. So how do we increase the ability for economic participation through childcare and entrepreneurship and employment? And for diversification, I kind of look at that as a two-parter too, is one is risk mitigation, not having all of our eggs in one basket and not having to depend on solely one company or one vertical or one industry to be able to help us be economically prosperous. Mm -hmm. And then my second one would be to increase our opportunity verticals. So do we have enough marketing jobs and enough finance jobs and enough tourism jobs? So to me, that's kind of how I look at both of those. Chris? Sure. Um, I'll try not to, I'll try to just add stuff where I have something that hasn't already been said. Um, so for economic development, just very simply, I would say it's about improving the economic dimensions of our community members' quality of life. Um, so it's, it's holistic, it's broad ranging, it's, it's what everyone's already talked about. Um, for diversification, I mean, I think taking it at face value is very simple. I mean, it means we're, we are a tourism based economy. It means building other things or strengthening other things that go alongside that. Um, the, the one thing I'd want to add here is, is to first maybe suggest that we consider is given where we're at with this kind of idea of diversification, which I guess I would say I think has become a bit polarizing, um, that maybe it's better for us to look at that next level down of an identity, like risk mitigation. Like why do we, why do specific reasons? And I think we could do a lot by focusing on them. Um, so, you know, I mean, that means things like resilience in our economy. We need a resilient economy. We need a sustainable economy. We need to lessen the seasonality. Um, if we can, you know, move the conversation in those directions, I think that the answers to how to solve those problems can actually come from both tourism and non-tourism, right? And that's what we want as a community. So that's, I guess that's where I would suggest maybe we can, we can kind of drive part of the conversation is instead of beginning with this dividing line between the tourism economy and the non-tourism economy, let's ask ourselves what problems we're trying to solve in the economy. And, and then put everything on the table for how we're going to get there, because that's actually also going to make more sense in terms of how we fund these initiatives, right? Because if we admit that tourism and tourism promotion, things that TRT can fund, can be a part of the solution that we used to call economic diversification, right? Then, then we're actually bringing more resources to the table while we have that conversation also, and should be working with Jenny and other folks around town, you know, as we do this, as we undertake this process. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, we're going to get to see all these, right? <laughs> That's going to take his best, and you can probably send him a note saying, I didn't say that. <laughs> I meant to say that. I said economic development is developing an environment where the economy is stable and energized to become more productive and creative. Economic development is broken into two parts, in my opinion the development and maintenance of the infrastructure for a strong economy such as housing, daycare, care, training, health, and safety. The second part is providing support to already established businesses and supporting and encouraging entrepreneurism and creating an environment that encourages outside business to locate in our area. Diversification is businesses that are not all dependent on one source. In our county, it's tourism, but it was extraction and other companies that count towns we've looked at is manufacturing, farming. I mean any any anything that the if the environment is uh, you know it, it, diver, uh, diversification is not having something that's dependent on what the majority is. So that's what I think. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so Economic development was very, mine was very similar, you know, growing well. Um, uh, community benefits, quality of life for our residents, but um, economic diversification for me is recognizing that the most stable and prosperous businesses are those that are homegrown. Generally, these enterprises start with solving a local problem with local resources. Um, they are embedded in the community, relying on local services, accountants, lawyers, market. Uh, marketers, etc., with local talent. Um, 
And then they put a float in a local parade. They spot the sponsor a local softball team. They have loyalty in the community and are inclined to stay, especially that this success is part of the community's identity. And I think that's um, sort of where we have lost some of our strength. So that was very good. Can we insert supporting your local museum as well as your local absolutely. softball team? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Megan. So I think because of my job or jobs, um, I think of things a little bit differently. Um, and I measure these a little bit differently than I think that uh, you do. So I have a little bit different look <laughs> on this. Um, anyway, so, so under economic development, we actually have measurements um, on this that I have to measure um, under uh, uh, my jobs. So obviously we do business development and workforce development. Um, and the first one, we have six different measurements on, on economic development. The first is proper business expansion um, and looking at where the gaps are and why our businesses aren't doing that proper um, work or proper expansion. Is it space? Is it know-how? Is it capital? Is it those different things? Um, and there's several different reasons why that is in this area and how can we tackle that. Um, the next is, um, uh, economic development is not just revenues increase because our businesses are making great revenues during tourist season and things like that, but it's also workforce development and success in planning. A lot of our businesses think success in planning is what we do with our businesses when we move on and we want to we want to retire, but it's also thinking about who's going to take that manager role, who's going to move into that next step, what's our our training progression plan. Um, and that's something that we're missing in a lot of our businesses. And one of the reasons why we have a huge um, turnover. Um, it also falls into our uh, wage increase is another one that we monitor. And that goes back into our custom fit. We're doing the same training over and over and over and over for the same businesses, up to $90,000 last year for one training in the area to the point where custom fits looking at cutting that training as an option to be able to train um, or to fund um, because so much money is going into that. Uh, and the question is why when we, we pulled it, it's because um, a customer or employee turnover, so they have to do that training again because it's a requirement for most of our businesses to have. And then looking in why we have so much turnover and uh, the cost the businesses are having to do, do that training um, is huge. Or to do training in general and training, for example, let's take guides, for example, training guides to do it every year over and over and over again to a huge sum of money. Um, and then the next is um, making our, our businesses, even our tourism businesses, year-round development our year-round jobs, um, which is already been that um, and the number of startups we have, and then capital infusion. I am um, surprised at the number of businesses in our county that actually miss out on capital, whether it be grants or loans, simply because they haven't been keeping their proper reports, or they're not willing to do their proper reports, or they don't know how to do like projections and things like that. It's, a lot of that comes back to know how and things like that, but they're missing out on that money. That goes back to proper expansion and those different pieces that could, could have a big impact on economic development. And then on the diversification, um, a lot of our diversification could happen with business um, collaboration. Um, competition. I always say competition is the 90s. There's enough for us to go around, and we all know that. <laughs> um, but having businesses collaborate together, what new opportunities can we create, especially on the year-round market, if businesses would collaborate together and come up with either a new product or a new service or, or, or bouncing things back and forth? Um, what new industries um, are needed within the community and bring in those new jobs that are not tourism related, which we've hit on? Um, a lot, and I hear all the time, this is just the way we've always done it. <laughs> and I'm sure you guys hear that too. Um, can we just like leave that at the door and start thinking about out of box? Diversification is thinking out of the box, out of the box business development, out of the box business growth, out of the box workforce development training, out of the box ways of looking at 
problems. And um, that's diversification in my is the thinking out of the box and throwing out this is the way we've always done it. Because the way we've always done it has gotten us where we are today, but the way we need to go in the future is thinking out of the box. So that's my that's great. Oh, there was amazing answer. <laughs> I'm just going, wow. And, and they did it. Oh, yeah. and it is five till five. Yeah, I know. And Mary, it is the reason I thought this is a really essential <laughs> exercise. Fairly asked the right question. Is this a good use of our time? But for me, hearing the the breadth of ideas and the ways that we can move forward, um, these are the kinds of words and ideas that don't get captured in a more tourism or less tourism. You know, and I think as we move forward and use this as a starting point for conversations in the community, after we just decide which of those particular elements, discrete aspects of it that we want to focus on, um, I think that that creates a real opportunity to move us forward and engage the community in a way that people start to understand what this, Economic Development Department is doing, why they're doing what they're doing, and and how they the department itself can be a catalyst for these kind of conversations. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very good. So, August, you have uh, some concluding yeah. observations and comments. There are some items from the agenda that I believe we can uh, table for next. Meeting. I think we're going to finish it. Are we going to finish it? Yeah. Better yet. <laughs> so um, I tried to capture kind of some vertical conversations that I think would have to ultimately start a handful of roundtables um, <laughs> focused on these, I think these end up aligning very similarly with where Megan's landing. But, you know, obviously this, that's the big picture. And then the second to this big question is what do we actually do? What programs do we run? How do we intervene? Um, so workforce development comes up again and again. Um, technical business assistance um, comes up again and again, providing some kind of low cost um, capital to businesses, affordable commercial space, um, whether we develop it or we're partnering with the private sector, but generally bringing it up, um, identifying and clearing impediments to development um, that we're looking for, how we define that, and then continuing to support the baseline economic infrastructure. In this case, we've been doing a lot of work in housing and childcare. Um, so, you know, my thoughts here and maybe concluding thoughts for the day is um, think about these and, and if we're thinking about this as, as topics for individual roundtables that would follow kind of a, an open, a general opener and we can have this style of conversation with anybody who's interested and then start to dive into, I think from our perspective, make sure we understand the system in which each of these topics operate. What are the resources that are already out there? How do we leverage them? What are the gaps and how do we step in and maximize them? Um, and try to put all of that with a similar set of um, topics that are kind of on the tourism side of things um, and put that all together into a, a larger process that you know has parallel tracks for each of these subject matters and have you know, each one of y'all kind of working um, or at least tracking and holding accountable moving one of these subsections forward um, or tandeming there. So that's my first thought. So I think my reflection, because we don't have time to really discuss this here today, would be what are we missing? What do we want to change? Um, and then we'll talk, have this basically the same conversation with the Travel Council Board meeting. And then, you know, Forrest and I and Jenny have kind of talked about potentially a joint meeting of both boards to kind of like bring this all together and, and kind of flesh out what, how do we actually start this? How do we do the timing? Who's going to be involved? Um, so, so that would be my, my call there. The, the last agenda item that let's fly through in one minute, um, of course, if you will, if you will grant me the opportunity to move to that next agenda item. So granted. Um, is looking forward for the rural county grant, rural county opportunity, rural communities opportunity grants. What are, what's kind of before us? So I spoke, spoke before about this kind of deadline for fiscal year 23, that we have to get everything spent by the end of June. The same deadline really applies for diversification TRT. So, you know, my hope is that we start this conversation and that informs those decisions. Um, it might not, you know, the conversation might not be at a point where it's like, well, here, we finished the plan, so now apply it to the spend, but informing that conversation and then continuing that so that can inform our, our budget formation for 2024, 
and beyond. Um, and within the context of rural county funds <clears throat> for this year, county grant funds, um, after we spent the, the this year's money by June, we have until August, it's the end of August to report that money to the state. Um, once we've done that on September 1st, if we can satisfactorily uh, fulfill the reporting requirements, then we're eligible to apply on October 1st for the next fiscal year grant program of that $200,000. Um, and if um, Hasu in this case had spent all of their money of the 300,000 that we got in that first place for the Sky and Arch development, we'd be eligible to apply for a competitive grant um, on December 15th. So those are kind of the, the on the rural county kind of grant sides, the, the deadlines that we're thinking about into the future for this year. Um, and then the, what's not on here is from our department perspective, is that we're going to start the budget process probably in August um, for all of the kind of TRT funding that we work on. But obviously, anything grant related, we're going to have to bake into that and you know, all the planning related to that. And, you know, the statutory guidance that the travel council provides is going to be baked into that. So, my hope is that, you know, this kind of planning exercise influences all of the actual, you know, requests and grants and budget priorities and everything else from there. Um, so, that's 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 all I have. That's great. It is shortly after five. Um, we had time for member comments, but let's save those for the beginning or early in the agenda at our next meeting because that gives us some time to review Ben's summary of all the comments that we had um, without losing sight of the fact that the department has some very specific deadlines that they have to meet over the next couple of months. Yeah, and then maybe um, email Forrest if there's anything you want to put on the agenda. Um, we'll do an agenda review internally sometime, uh, probably two weeks before the next meeting. Yep. And so if there's stuff that you all y'all want to have us discuss, send that to Forrest so that Forrest can work on putting that agenda together with us. Yeah. Thank you all online for joining us today. Thanks for your participation. Hope to see you around the table in one of the next couple of meetings. And Hopefully have we'll be back in the chamber. I'm sorry? Hopefully we'll be back in the chamber. We'll be back in the chamber. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody around the room. I would entertain a motion. Oh, Jasmine was just waving goodbye. Okay. Uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Seconded. Meeting. Anybody who wants to stay on longer? <laughs> okay. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Let's do it. Thank you all. The meeting is adjourned. Nice work. Well done. I was about to say, I don't know if we even need to do a motion or something. I think you may have the power to just adjourn a meeting. But we'll figure it out. In my other world, I have to. Yeah, no, that's great. But I say at the end of the meeting, we've reached the end of the agenda. If no one objects, then we'll agree. There you go. There you and then if somebody says, wait, I have something else to do, yeah. then you do it. But yeah. that's no, just you just pretend you don't see the hand up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Another approach. Only kidding. Another approach. No, I did. Sweet. Wow. Thank you. Thank you.